Well, Shalom Haverim, welcome, my dear friends, to a brand new Bible study series. Uh, and obviously, um, according to the screen in front of you, this is going to be a study on 1 Corinthians. Uh, this first video in the 1 Corinthians uh, series um, will be kind of a background video. Because uh, 1 Corinthians, like of all the uh, New Testament uh, writings, uh, understanding the background of 1 Corinthians will be a big help uh, when we finally get around to uh, looking at the text of uh, 1 Corinthians. So first thing I'd like to do today is uh, just do a little bit of background study uh, about the author of 1 Corinthians. It's our friend, the Apostle Paul. And uh, also, just a little bit of background about how the church in Corinth came to be. So that will be our focus uh, today. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention to you is that um, I am going to be using, at least I'm going to start using, a new version of the Bible. It's not actually a new version, but I haven't used it in uh, videos before. And I really haven't used it uh, too much um, in... Um, um, you know, Bible studies and writings and things that I have done. Uh, the version that I'm going to uh, at least start using in 1 Corinthians is a version of the Bible called the Tree of Life version, the, the uh, TLV. Uh, Tree of Life version is a Messianic Jewish um, version of the Bible. And the thing that you'll notice uh, probably uh, right up front with this version is that um, most of the names uh, in, uh, in this version of the Bible are presented in their Hebrew form. Like when uh, Jesus Christ is mentioned, the uh, uh, Tree of Life version will say Yeshua, the Messiah. Uh, it's just a uh, Hebrew version of the uh, Greek and then uh, uh, English uh, version uh, of that. So a lot of the names are changed. A lot of the names are not changed. In one of the video series that I did, I used the complete Jewish Bible, which is another uh, Messianic Jewish uh, version of the Bible. But I think it changes every uh, name in the Bible to the Hebrew uh, version. So uh, in that Bible, when it's talking about uh, Peter, it calls him Kepha, because Kepha is the, Greek, is the uh, Hebrew word for the rock, uh, which is uh, what the Greek version of his name, Petros, means. So um, uh, they do that, even though uh, in the uh, Greek New Testament, it's presented in, uh, Peter's name is presented in its Greek form, uh, Petros. So... I will say that the Tree of Life version is not as thorough in uh, changing names to the Hebrew version. And there will be some other changes, and I'll point those out along the way. For example, uh, if 1 Corinthians talks about baptism uh, in the uh, Tree of Life version, it will be called immersion. Uh, because there are certain words in uh, Christian lingo, Christian vocabulary, that are offensive uh, to uh, Jewish people. And these Messianic Jewish versions of the Bible are designed primarily to present the biblical message, especially the gospel, to Jewish people who are not yet uh, believers. So uh, Messianic Jews are Jewish people um, uh, who are descended from uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, although that's uh, very difficult to determine uh, these days uh, if these family trees are intact uh, or not. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, uh, the, uh, the main purpose of a Messianic Jewish um, translation of the Bible is to present the, is for Messianic Jewish people, believing Jewish people, to present the gospel to Jewish people who are not uh, believers, or I like to say not yet believers, because the uh, uh, conversion of uh, Jewish uh, people, um, like uh, unbelieving uh, Jewish people, to uh, faith in Yeshua the Messiah is just uh, going through the roof today. Uh, just in my uh, brief lifetime, uh, the numbers of uh, conversions of Jewish people to Christianity is uh, just astonishing. It's uh, uh, I guess I would call it a geometric uh, progression rather than arith 
uh, medic. So anyway, we're going to be using this uh, version of the Bible. Um, if I really don't like it and it doesn't uh, seem to be uh, as accurate as uh, I like uh, Bibles to be, then we, we may change to something else. But that's the version we'll be using uh, initially. So uh, yeah, the screen in front of you is a modern day picture of uh, Corinth. Uh, some of the uh, ruins of Corinth, probably from one of the pagan temples uh, there in the city of uh, Corinth. So uh, that'll be kind of our um, standard backdrop for this Bible study of 1 Corinthians. Uh, as in many of the uh, Bible study videos that I do, I like to uh, do a little commercial and advertise the first book that I ever wrote. It's called Yeshua. He will be called a Nazarene. And uh, this book uh, connects uh, Jesus uh, with the, uh, the uh, Essenes, which are best known nowadays as the Dead Sea Scrolls people. And um, the, the best known of that group uh, lived in a place called Qumran. And here the uh, picture right in the middle of the screen is an artist's concept of what the uh, Qumran community looked like. And uh, that's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were uh, hidden in the caves uh, beyond the city and so forth. And just recently uh, discovered back in uh, like 1947 or so. And uh, just have uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls have provided us with just a wealth of information about the Second Temple uh, era, which is this, uh, the um, uh, era of uh, history that we will be studying. So, uh, yeah, this book, Yeshua, he will be called a Nazarene connects Jesus with this group, the Nazarenes and Essenes, the Dead Sea Scrolls people, and really explains a lot. When we come to understand about what that group believed and what their uh, religious practices were, um, it sounds very much like uh, early Christianity. And uh, the reason it sounds so very much like early Christianity is, uh, in my uh, studied opinion. I think that's exactly what it was. Um, uh, Jesus uh, in the New Testament is called uh, the Nazarene many, many times. Uh, in only a few places is he called Jesus of Nazareth, like uh, less than five times. Uh, he's, he's called Jesus of Nazareth, but many, many, many times he is called uh, Yeshua Hanotsri, Jesus the Nazarene. So uh, that will help us to explain some of the uh, interactions between uh, Jesus and his followers, the Nazarenes. Uh, the word Christian came uh, quite a bit later in the uh, Acts chronology. And uh, so uh, a lot of the uh, hostility that the uh, early Christian church experienced uh, in the first century, the apostolic century, uh, was from uh, Jewish people of different sects uh, S-E-C-T-S, uh, the Nazarenes, and uh, their, uh, uh, the Nazarenes were actually a branch group from the Essenes. Uh, the Essenes were celibate monks, and the Nazarenes believed all the same things that the Essenes did, only they uh, married and uh, had families, marriages and families, raised kids and, and so forth. So that was, that was the main uh, difference. Uh, but doctrinally and practice-wise, uh, there was a lot of uh, conflict between uh, the Nazarene Essenes, on the one hand, and then the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which are very well-known uh, sects of Judaism that were operating uh, at the time of Jesus. And uh, we'll point out some of the con uh, conflicts between those groups uh, when we uh, come across them. And then the uh, picture down at the bottom of the page is a uh, Bible chart. It's kind of a chronological chart from a uh, book of chronological uh, charge by, uh, charts by a theologian named uh, Alfred Ede, E-A-D-E. -E. Uh, you can get the whole book of those uh, charts if you are as much of a chart nerd as uh, I am. And uh, the one that's depicted here is the one that just illustrates the Second uh, Temple era. Uh, some people call it the time between the Testaments. Sometimes it's called the silent era, the silent 400 years. But when we study that era, we discover that it was anything but silent. It was very active, very exciting, a uh, neat period of uh, time to uh, study. The other book I want to advertise is the one on the right side of the screen, which is just a uh, commentary on the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. 
Uh, these are both uh, epistles written by Paul, who was an apostle of Yeshua the Nazarene. An apostle is someone who is sent on a special mission by Yeshua, by Jesus, and uh, Paul certainly was. Uh, he spread the gospel uh, basically to the north and west of the uh, promised land of uh, Israel uh, in, an, in a more noteworthy fashion than any of the other uh, apostles, at least that I'm uh, aware of. So both of these books, if you're interested in getting uh, either one or both of them, are available on Amazon. Amazon is the best place to, uh, to purchase my uh, books. Uh, in uh, some of the other um, uh, video Bible series that we have done, we have used the Acts chronology, uh, the chronology of the events of the book of Acts, just to kind of highlight some important um, points and events on that timeline. Uh, the ones that are highlighted in red are the ones that I will want to focus on in First and Second Corinthians. Uh, because in the uh, years 52 to 53, about a two-year span uh, of the years uh, of the first century, uh, usually known as AD, uh, modern-day scholars use CE as an abbreviation for the common era uh, in preference to AD, which stands for Anno Domini, the years of our Lord. So the uh, secularists in the scholarly realm prefer CE. So uh, we'll go along with that because we want to reach some unbelievers uh, as well. It was uh, during these two years that Paul and Silas embarked on Paul's second missionary journey. And it was during the second missionary journey that the church at uh, Corinth uh, was founded. It was planted uh, there and uh, uh, those two guys uh, hung around for a while and uh, did some uh, pretty important ministry there in uh, Corinth. Also, the years 55 to 58 are highlighted because that was Paul's third missionary journey. And during the third missionary journey, he had some interaction with the church at Corinth, but really didn't spend a lot of time there in person. And we'll talk about some of these uh, interactions uh, in our study uh, for today. But it was during that third missionary journey that both letters to the uh, church at Corinth uh, were uh, written. So uh, that's about all we need to look at for the uh, Acts chronology. Uh, let's go to the uh, uh, kind of the uh, uh, two maps uh, of the uh, second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, which is right here on the left, and then the third missionary journey, which is on the right. And uh, let me just kind of um, highlight some of the uh, major events so we can put uh, the the history of the church at Corinth in kind of a uh, chronological uh, perspective. The second missionary journey began from Paul's uh, home church in Antioch of Syria. There are two significant cities of uh, Antioch mentioned uh, in the uh, uh, book of Acts. Uh, this is the one that was in Syria up uh, a bit north of the promised land of Israel, and it was Paul's home church. He was a leader in the church there, and uh, so on the second missionary journey, he and Silas, his uh, traveling companion and colleague, uh, started out from Antioch and went over land. Now, um, before we go any further with this missionary journey, on the on the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, his traveling companion was Barnabas, and they left from the same spot in Antioch. They went to Cyprus, and did um, uh, mission work there in Cyprus. And uh, then they went up to uh, what is generally uh, understood to be the, um, uh, you would call it the, uh, the Galatian region of, uh, of Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. And they founded four churches there. And one of those churches was in another city called Antioch, but it was in the region of Pisidia. So here's uh, Antioch in Pisidia. They also founded a church at Iconium, which was just down the road to the east, then one at, at uh, Lystra, and the fourth church they founded there was Derby. And then when Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians, it was uh, specifically written to those four churches in the Galatian region. Uh, Galatia, I know the label is up here, but the green extends down to 
where the area where these four churches are. Well, on the second missionary journey, um, uh, by the way, um, before that missionary journey, the second missionary journey started, uh, Paul and Barnabas had a little bit of a falling out, and it was about uh, John Mark, who turns out to be the author of the uh, Gospel of Mark. But he started out with them on the first missionary journey, and uh, when they landed in uh, Asia Minor or Turkey, um, uh, John, Mark, for some reason, uh, changed his mind about the mission trip and went home to Jerusalem. And Paul was irritated about this, but John Mark was a, I think it was a nephew, maybe, or a cousin of uh, Barnabas. So Barnabas uh, was a little uh, friendlier towards, uh, towards um, uh, John Mark than Paul was. And uh, Paul and, uh, and Barnabas split. So uh, 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 Barnabas had a second missionary journey also. He went uh, first to Cyprus, kind of retraced the path of the uh, first missionary journey. And I think he may have gone to the Galatian region after that too. And uh, he and John Mark uh, traveled together. Paul and Silas, on the other hand, went overland and visited these four churches in uh, Derby and Lystra and Iconium and uh, Antioch and Pisidia. But uh, they decided to extend their uh, mission activities to the West. Uh, they had only made it about halfway through um, Asia Minor, and so they intended to go on. And the uh, red line here on the map is the probable route that they took. And uh, like when they uh, got up um, around this area, uh, uh, Paul and Silas decided that the, uh, the, the best strategic uh, direction for them to take was down here in Mycenae. Uh, so they started to go in that direction, and then the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit stopped them uh, from going over there for uh, some uh, reason that's unknown to me, and so they decided, well, if we can't go to Mycia, then we'll go up here to uh, Bithynia and Pontus and uh, just kind of travel north and, and do the same kind of ministry there. And uh, the Holy Spirit didn't like that idea either. So they kind of split the difference and went to Troas, which is uh, on the uh, kind of western shore of uh, Turkey or Asia Minor. It's ancient Troy, where the Battle of Troy took place and the story of the Trojan horse and stuff like that. Well, there was an actual city called Troas, and that's where uh, Paul and Silas went. And uh, during the night, one night, Paul had a dream. I think it was a dream. It might have been a vision while he was awake. Anyway, they had some kind of a visual uh, message or revelation. And uh, the, the uh, vision or the dream was about a man from Macedonia who begged these two uh, gospel missionaries to come to Macedonia and help them. Well, Macedonia is over here on the map. <clears throat> Macedonia is in the northern regions of the, the Greek peninsula. And then the dark area down here used to be called Achaia, and uh, that is Greece proper. Uh, so um, these two guys were obedient to, to the uh, Holy Spirit. And uh, they continued on. One of the things I should have mentioned probably is uh, when they were back among the Galatian churches, uh, they met Timothy, who had a uh, Greek dad and a Jewish mom. And uh, so uh, Timothy showed uh, great um, uh, potential as a uh, Christian leader. And uh, so they um, uh, took him along on their uh, travels. Now, also, one of the things that we notice in the book of Acts is at certain points in these missionary journeys, the uh, pronoun changes from he and they to we. And uh, most scholars think that uh, during the we sections in Acts, that indicates that Luke, uh, who was also uh, a traveling companion of the uh, ministry team, um, uh, the, uh, it's usually thought that the we parts are where Luke joined uh, the travels, and then when it reverts back to uh, first person and third person, uh, then Luke uh, kind of uh, dro dropped out of the picture, uh, at least temporarily. And Luke uh, wrote a gospel uh, also. So in obedience to this uh, vision or dream, they uh, traveled uh, this away and went to Neapolis, which is a seaport in um uh in macedonia 
And uh, the first place they stopped off was a, a Roman colony called uh, Philippi. And um, there wasn't much of a Jewish representation there, but they did find some Jewish people that they witnessed to. And Lydia was one of them. And so um, uh, the uh, missionary team started a, a house church in Lydia's uh, home. Uh, they ran into some trouble there because they had kind of a spiritual warfare deal uh, with a girl that was demon possessed and they set her free from her demonic bondage. Uh, but then she lost her ability to tell fortunes and her masters uh, were very much offended by that. So they ended up throwing uh, Paul and uh, Silas in prison uh, there in Philippi and uh, the uh, like their first night in prison, they started a worship service there in the prison and they're singing hymns and spiritual songs and reading the scriptures and just having a wonderful time. So God sent an earthquake that broke them out of the prison. The walls of the prison came tumbling down. So uh, they could have escaped, but they didn't. They decided to uh, witness to the jailer, to the uh, prison warden there and uh, converted him to Christianity and his household, and I bet you they started another house church there in the, uh, in the home of the uh, prison uh, warden. Well, they made a few other stops along the way. Uh, one of those uh, stops was Thessalonica. Uh, here's the label on the map, but the dot is right here, just uh, kind of down the road from Philippi, and uh, they also started a church uh, there. But they weren't treated very well by the non-Messianic Jews in Thessalonica. So they had a very brief stay in Thessalonica until they were kind of run out of town by the Sadducees and the Pharisees uh, in, that, uh, in that location. Uh, so they uh, left Thessalonica and went to Berea. Uh, Berea is another Macedonian uh, city. And uh, the book of Acts tells us that the a Berean uh, believers, I guess, were more noble. Now, I guess we would we would have to say the uh, the Jewish uh, community in Berea was more noble than the uh, Jewish community had been in either Philippi or especially Thessalonica. And um, uh, when uh, Paul and uh, Silas and whoever else was with them uh, taught from the scriptures and preached. Uh, the Bereans would get out their Bibles and check all this stuff out and make sure they were telling the truth. And they kind of established a model that uh, all Bible readers, especially believers, should follow, that when you hear preaching or teaching, you should check it all out and make sure it's in harmony with the Bible. So eventually uh, they left uh, Berea and Paul traveled uh, down uh, by this kind of winding route to Athens, which is a huge city in Greece. They've left Macedonia. Now they're in Greece uh, proper. And uh, so Paul spent some time in Athens uh, there. He even preached in what is called the Areopagus or Mars Hill, which was a hangout for uh, philosophers. Uh, but also some like legal judges were there and so forth. And uh, so uh, uh, Paul joined the philosophers in sharing his philosophy, which was the gospel of Yeshua, the Messiah, uh, there on uh, Mars Hill, and made a few converts. But Athens is one of the few cities where uh, Paul visited where a church didn't get planted. At least there's not one mentioned uh, in the book of Acts. And uh, then from Athens, he went on to Corinth. And uh, that's the church we're most interested in for this uh, video Bible study uh, series. And one of the things I want to point out to you, actually, I think I'll point it out to you uh, in a few minutes from now, because it's harder to uh, notice what I'm going to be talking about. But, but we'll, we'll talk about it uh, in, in a few minutes here. Uh, he stayed in Corinth for quite a while, uh, started out in the synagogue, which was his uh, standard uh, practice was to go first to the synagogue because everybody was familiar with the Bible there. Uh, everybody was familiar with uh, Jewish tradition and uh, practice. And so there was common ground for uh, Paul to uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he did that in Corinth. 
Um, usually his practice was to preach in the synagogue as long as they would have him. That is until he got kicked out. And once he got kick, kicked out, then he would take some of the believers that he had found in the synagogue and uh, start house churches uh, in the homes of these believers. So, um, you know, in a pretty good sized city like Corinth, there might have been quite a few house churches there in order to, you know, uh, have enough, uh, what room space to, uh, uh, to hold all the believers that uh, would have been there. The, uh, so Paul stays in Corinth for a while. Uh, when, um, when the end of his uh, second missionary journey uh, draws near, he leaves Corinth. He goes over here to Ephesus for just a very brief uh, stay, and uh, then he um, returns by sea to uh, Jerusalem. And after he stays in Jerusalem a while, he travels back up north to Antioch, his home uh, congregation, and uh, the circle then is unbroken. So uh, he completes his journey. Then the third missionary journey starts almost immediately after his return to Antioch. And uh, he begins his third missionary journey by going once again through these four uh, churches in, uh, in Asia Minor, the Galatian churches. Uh, but then he goes directly from there to Ephesus. And he spends uh, an awful lot of time in his... Uh, third missionary journey in Ephesus. And while he's in Ephesus, he will be having uh, quite a bit of dealings with the uh, church at Corinth. So he will be doing kind of long distance uh, ministry uh, from there. And because of some of the issues that the Corinthians are struggling with, he sends his friend Titus from Ephesus to go north through Macedonia and down to Corinth and visit the church there and, um, you know, give Paul uh, Paul hopes to um, uh, kind of reconnect with uh, Titus later on and get a kind of an unbiased uh, report on, uh, on what's going on uh, in, uh, in the church at Corinth. And uh, because of Paul's efforts to uh, work out some of the issues that were going on in Corinth, it required some sternness on his uh, part. And he was afraid, he loved the Corinthians so very much that he was afraid this ministry that he felt obligated to do, being stern, being a uh, kind of a disciplinarian, uh, he was afraid that uh, maybe that would interfere with the uh, relationship and the fellowship that he would uh, be able to have with the, um, uh, with the uh, Corinthian uh, Christians. So uh, eventually they um, reconnect. Uh, we will talk about some of the interactions uh, between Paul and the Corinthian Christians, between Ephesus and Corinth, uh, in just a few minutes here. But then he completes the uh, third missionary journey and returns to uh, Jerusalem, where he is arrested um, for being a Nazarene, actually, and, um, and believing what the Nazarenes believed and uh, practicing what the Nazarenes uh, practiced and so forth. Um, the next slide is uh, kind of a history of the Apostle Paul. So let us um, uh, go ahead uh, here <clears throat> and uh, give a little history of Paul. Uh, first bullet point is that he was born to a Jewish family of Roman citizen citizenship in Tarsus. Tarsus was a major city in Asia Minor, not that far from the uh, four Galatian churches. It was a little bit uh, further to the east. And uh, of course, all those uh, churches were in Asia Minor, which is uh, nowadays called uh, Turkey. And uh, Paul was born into the tribe of Benjamin. So uh, that was the tribe of the first king of uh, Israel. King Saul was a Benjamite. Uh, Paul was a member of that tribe. So it was a noteworthy tribe. But also keep in mind that Paul had Roman citizenship, uh, which um, carried with it some uh, important privileges of Roman citizenship. He was raised as a Pharisee in Jerusalem. Now, this is a little bit ironic because the... Um, uh, Pharisees turn out to be the enemies of the uh, Christians, the Nazarenes, and uh, Paul started out as a Pharisee, and um, uh, he was actually a um, pretty faithful Pharisee in his opposition to uh, Yeshua and the uh, Christians. Um, 
Uh, as a uh, young man, he was uh, raised in Jerusalem uh, as a disciple of Gamaliel, who is mentioned in the uh, book of Acts, uh, maybe in one of the Gospels, uh, too. Uh, Gamaliel is uh, famous. He was a, a leader of the uh, the um, uh, Council of the uh, Elders, the Sanhedrin, and uh, he was the grandson of a very famous rabbi called Hillel the Great. Uh, just about every Jewish person is familiar with the debates between um, Shammai, who was also a great rabbi, and Hillel. And uh, Hillel was a little bit more liberal. Shammai was a bit more uh, conservative and strict. Uh, but Paul was associated with this um, very prominent uh, rabbi. And most people feel like Paul was being groomed to be a leader in the Sanhedrin. Uh, when we meet him, uh, first of all, in uh, the book of Acts around chapter uh, 7 and 8 and then 9, uh, he is the arch enemy of the early followers of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Uh, he persecuted the Nazarene Christian church in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, that story of his persecution is told in Acts chapter 6, verse 8 through chapter 8, verse 3. And uh, this is the story of Stephen, one of the uh, early Christian deacons, uh, who was, um, I guess, the first one that Acts of the Apostles tells us was martyred. Uh, for the faith. So, uh, yeah, uh, Paul is uh, the one who uh, persecuted um, Stephen and uh, probably brought the charges against him that resulted in his death. And by the way, uh, his, um, uh, his uh, Hebrew birth name was Shaul or Saul. So really, until he becomes a believer in Yeshua, he is known in the Bible and in the Jewish community as Shaul of Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus. When he becomes a believer, he becomes better known as Paul, uh, which I think is a Greek name, and it means a uh, little person. That might be Hebrew. Paul may be Hebrew, uh, but I think it's a Greek name. And a lot of people think that uh, when he became a believer that Jesus changed his name to Paul. And I guess that's a possibility, but chances are as a Roman citizen, but also a Jew, he probably had a Hebrew and a Greek name. So we are going to know him as Shaul of Tarsus and also uh, Paul, the apostle of uh, Yeshua. Um, while he was, uh, I guess, in the midst of his persecution of the church in Jerusalem, uh, most uh, notably uh, Stephen, uh, he decided to uh, carry his persecution further north and uh, was going to Damascus. Now, Damascus is interesting because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is a, a very significant document called the Damascus Document, uh, which leads us to believe that there was a prominent Nazarene Essene community in Damascus. And Paul would have known this uh, so the Essenes were prominent in Jerusalem and Qumran and the, the, the Judean region, uh, but they were also prominent in Damascus. So I think that's probably why Paul went there to get at these Nazarene Essenes and, uh, and to um, uh, press charges against them, bring them to uh, Jerusalem for a trial and so forth. And he had the authority of the uh, Sadducean high priests to uh, persecute the believers in Yeshua there. So chapter 9 is the beginning of uh, uh, Paul's uh, story, the story of his journey to Damascus, where he intends to persecute the church. Uh, but it turns out differently. And uh, so uh, chapter 9 takes place in about the year 37 CE, or Common Era, which would be, I don't know, about four years after uh, Yeshua rose uh, from the dead. Uh, there he, uh, on the, uh, in route to Damascus, he encountered the risen Yeshua on the road to Damascus and became a believer. And I think I would, I think I would do if I had a personal encounter with the risen Yeshua. And uh, he becomes a believer there. He experiences ministry from a guy named uh, Ananias who lived in uh, Damascus, probably an Essene or a Nazarene Essene. And um, uh, not only does he hear the gospel, but he also uh, gets healed from a temporary blindness that came upon him uh, as a result of this encounter. Uh, 
And once he becomes a believer in uh, in Damascus, he starts preaching uh, Yeshua there. And, um, you know, some people have a problem with that. They say, well, you know, he should have studied under a, a Christian leader, under a, a, a like a Nazarene leader and learned more about Yeshua. Uh, but this guy was uh, brilliant. He was very scholarly. He knew enough about Yeshua to persecute the church. So um, uh, he just changed his mind about Yeshua there. And, and as a believer, uh, he became, uh, you know, one of the most dedicated and uh, effective of all the uh, apostles of uh, Yeshua. Some people count uh, Paul as uh, like one of the 12 apostles. Uh, people who don't like Matthias, who was elected by the church in Jerusalem to take Judas' place among the 12, uh, they like to make Paul the uh, 12th apostle after Judas' death, and others feel like, no, Matthias was legit, but Paul was just an additional capital A apostle. Uh, there were other apostles, and uh, Paul's traveling companion Barnabas is one of them, but most people uh, spell that kind of apostle with a small a. So the capital A apostles are used to designate the 12 or the baker's dozen, the 13, if you include Paul that way. And then the other ones like Barnabas are kind of apostle with a small a, because some of the uh, uh, characteristics, the features, the empowerings of these uh, capital A apostles uh, were not the possession and experience of the lowercase uh, a apostles. So, uh, yep, that's the ministry there in Damascus till they try to kill him. <laughs> so he escapes, uh, travels to uh, Jerusalem, and this is dated about 40 CE. And he goes with uh, Barnabas. This may be the first time he met uh, Barnabas, uh, who, who proved to be a very loyal uh, friend and companion and maybe mentor for uh, Shaul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle. And uh, those two travel uh, for the first time uh, to uh, Jerusalem as uh, Nazarene, uh, Paul being a Nazarene Christian. Now, there's some debate about whether Paul remained a Pharisee as a believer in Yeshua. I think he didn't. I think he converted from Phariseeism to Nazareneism. Uh, but some people believe that he maintained his uh, Pharisaic. Um, association. And there are some reasons. Uh, I mean, the uh, <clears throat> uh, he even claims his uh, Pharisee background in some of the uh, epistles that he writes, and uh, also in the book of Acts. But I think his conversion was complete and that he considered himself a, uh, a Nazarene uh, or a, uh, a Christian. So uh, yeah, I come to uh, Jerusalem and uh, preached uh, for a little bit there. Uh, until they tried to kill him, and then he fled to Tarsus. Tarsus is his hometown uh, up in, um, in uh, Asia Minor. In 43 CE, about uh, three years later, he's brought by Barnabas to Syrian Antioch and became a leader there. And I don't know if that was a new church or Barnabas just realized that Saul was a good fit for that church, but uh, so uh, they um, they came to uh, Syrian Antioch, and Paul became one of the most prominent uh, leaders in that congregation. Then 46 to 48 BC, uh, Paul and Barnabas embark on their first missionary journey, which we looked at on the map, to Cyprus and uh, Asia Minor, where they planted those four churches in the Galatian region. 51 CE is Paul's third visit to uh, Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council. And uh, the big issue there was, uh, what is the relationship of a a uh, believer in Yeshua to uh, the Old Covenant or the Old Testament and the Law of Moses. And the council decided that um, uh, for believers in Yeshua who have been born again, they actually fall under the authority of the New Covenant and the Law of Yeshua. It's also called the Law of Liberty, uh, the Law of uh, kind of the fulfillment of the Old Testament and the Law of Moses and so forth. So that was all worked out at the uh, Jerusalem Council. Then Paul and Silas embarked on their second missionary journey. We looked at that on the map, uh, which extended into Europe, Macedonia, and Greece. And then uh, 55 to 58 is Paul's third missionary journey, where he spends a lot of time at Ephesus and writes the Corinthian letters and makes several visits to uh, Corinth. 
We also want to talk a little bit about the uh, background of the church at Corinth and kind of will. Uh, so uh, some of the uh, noteworthy characteristics of this community is that in 52 to 53 CE, Paul and Silas founded the church at Corinth. Uh, we are going to be reading uh, in this uh, video from Acts chapter 18 to the first few verses of uh, chapter 19, verse 5, and that's the story in Acts of the founding of the uh, church at Corinth. Corinth was the capital of the Roman senatorial province of Achaia uh, and was uh, ruled by a proconsul named uh, Gallio. Now, that may come as a surprise to people that it, that Corinth was the capital. Uh, uh, when Athens is in that uh, same, what, region of uh, Greece. Uh, but the uh, relationship of Athens um, is, uh, I think it was, it was a prominent city, and it's the ancient capital of the, the country of Greece, but it was not a senatorial province. Corinth was. So the Senate had control and authority. The Roman Senate had uh, authority over the uh, city of Corinth and made it their Roman capital. And it was ruled by a proconsul, which was a representative of the Roman Senate. And uh, his name, as we meet him in the book of Acts, was Gallio. Corinth was infamous for its immorality. An idiom of the era categorized all matters of misbehavior, particularly of a sexual type, as to Corinthianize. Now, that's a reputation that most cities would not want to have, <laughs> that the name of their city would represent uh, immoral, uh, immoral behavior, particularly sexual immorality. But it was great for Corinth because of the kind of city it was. Corinth was a seaport city, city on the northwest north side of an isthmus. And on the southeast side was the city of Concrea. Now, uh, I thought I had a bigger map here, and maybe I don't have a bigger map. Maybe I forgot to put it on my PowerPoint. But if you remember back to the map that we looked at earlier, well, I, I'm going to go ahead and go back to it, and then I'll be embarrassed if I actually do have a, a map. So here's Greece, and uh, here is Corinth on the northwest side of this isthmus here, and uh, Concrea is on the... Uh, southeast side. And you'll notice these inlets, these gulfs here on both the western and eastern side. And I think this, um, this uh, body of land is called the Peloponnesus. And nowadays, there's a canal that goes through here from Corinth to Concrea. And so ships can sail right through there. But in biblical times, the canal was not there. So in order to save sailing time to prevent having to go around the uh, southern cape of uh, Achaia, uh, sailors would uh, sail in the Gulf here. It would be smooth sailing here. They would dock at Corinth. They would unload the cargo from their ships onto carts, which would be transported across the isthmus here to Concrea, where they would uh, load up their cargo on other ships and then continue onward uh, to the east, or vice versa. It could go both ways. So both Corinth and Concrea are uh, seaport cities. And if you've ever spent any time in the naval service, like I have, then you know uh, that seaport cities are notorious <laughs> for immorality. And uh, so, uh, like... Uh, you know, why was that? Well, let's go on reading here. Corinth was a seaport city on the northwest side of an isthmus. On the southeast side was the city of Concrea. Cargo ships would make port at either city and portage their cargoes across the isthmus to save time sailing around the Peloponnesus. Such maritime cities have constant interaction with sailors who bring their long periods of abstinence and associated lusts for all kinds of pleasure to their ports of call. And I don't care where it is in the world, a place where sailors go after spending months uh, at sea is going to have lots of bars and lots of brothels. And uh, that was certainly true uh, of uh, both Corinth and Concrea. The church at Corinth was a church plagued by worldliness due to its cultural context, which we were just talking about, besetting sins, 
which is, uh, it's usually in an individual, it's the sin that plagues you like throughout your earthly life. It's the sin that you would, you'd like to have in your rear view mirror, but you just can't shake it. It's just kind of too inbred. It may involve uh, addictive um, uh, characteristics, um, you know, things like drinking and drug abuse. Uh, there are sexual addictions. Nowadays, we have uh, addictions to pornography and things like that. So all this stuff was going on in the city of Corinth. And then some, you know, believers, uh, some people are converted to faith in Christ and they know their life has to change. But they struggled with uh, with these besetting sins that continue to plague and lure back into the old ways, even those who had embraced Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. However, the Corinthians were by nature creatures who set much stock in experiences. Now, previous to meeting Yeshua, most of their experiences are going to be on the dark side and um, involve immorality. But having lived your life that way, when you convert to a religion like Christianity, you have an expectation that it's going to also offer you um, some great experiences, maybe supernatural ones, that are going to counter, you know, you're going from the dark side to the light side. So you hope the power and the experience of the light side is even more powerful and more dramatic than what you experienced on the dark side. And that's the way it's presented in the Bible. So, you know, if you're used to having uh, dark side experiences, follow Yeshua and you'll have light side experiences that will be even more profound, more exciting, more powerful than what you had before. Uh, so they put much stock in uh, experience. When they sought to separate themselves from their sinful, immoral experiences, they endeavored to replace those worldly experiences with spiritual ones. This was not a mistake. Because of the experiential, orienta experiential orientation of the Corinthians, the church was perhaps more than any other a power church. This is one of the uh, books of the New Testament where spiritual gifts, miracles and stuff, are uh, discussed because it was uh, because this was a church that was wide open to those kinds of experiences. So it was a power church, abounding in spiritual gifts and moving experiences of the Holy Spirit. But one of the things that Paul had to deal with uh, he, when he was in Corinth and later when he was ministering long distance to them was that uh, these Corinthians were struggling to get their dark past behind them. And they were uh, still getting caught up in immorality, and it was uh, uh, obviously a hindrance to their uh, spiritual growth. Uh, next bullet point. Paul uh, determined that his mission to the uh, Corinthian church was to encourage their authentic spirituality, but to provide legitimate boundaries for their religious expressions so that the activities of the church would be characterized by decency and order. Let me give you a modern day uh, ex, uh, ex, ex, example of this. Uh, charismatic and Pentecostal churches, which are experience-oriented churches, and um, that is not a condemnation of those kind of churches, but people talk about them as exhibiting bizarre behavior like snake handling, for example. And they talk about charismatics swinging from the chandeliers and uh, they call them holy rollers because sometimes they are slain in the spirit and fall down on the ground, maybe roll around on the ground under the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, this stuff can be legitimate, but it can also be a hindrance to uh, people, believers and unbelievers, who are not familiar with spiritual experience, and uh, so can be offended. It can be a hindrance to uh, uh, the evangelistic uh, work of uh, individuals and congregations. In addition, Paul would need to uh, encourage them to make use of the grace of God uh, that God had provided them uh, to bring their sinfulness, some of which was gross and extreme. And uh, when we come to 1 Corinthians 5, you'll see what I'm talking about here. Under the lordship of Yeshua and the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, I, uh, I talk about this grace of God working in the life of a believer from personal experience, because I have had some addictions that I have been set free from, uh, addictions that I could not overcome uh, by my own willpower and discipline and things like that. And I consider myself a, a pretty disciplined person. I spent uh, quite a few years in the Marine Corps. And uh, the Marine Corps is, you know, notorious for its discipline. Well, discipline wouldn't do it with these uh, spiritual uh, issues. And uh, I have been set free from uh, some of those addictive behaviors. And the Holy Spirit and his power and God's grace uh, is the only way that I uh, found any uh, freedom and uh, liberty. So uh, it was there in Corinth that Paul met Priscilla and Aquila, I guess Aquila is listed first here. They're a husband and wife team of uh, Jewish believers in Yeshua. Now, because Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla were all tent makers, and I, I take that, I mean, some people say they made these prayer shawls, and uh, I just don't see that. Uh, maybe, maybe that's what they were engaged in, but I think they were legitimate tent makers. They made tents that you could live in. Uh, and they engaged in this trade while in Corinth. Uh, Paul was thus able to make a living. One of the things that we learn about the Apostle Paul is that the uh, church in Philippi, although they gave Paul a hard time when he was there, uh, they were very generous when it came to uh, giving offerings, especially to missionaries like Paul. So the uh, Philippian uh, congregation and some of the other Macedonian congregations provided money so that Paul could minister in Corinth and some other places free of charge. Uh, now, you can debate whether it's a good idea uh, for a church to get a pastor free of charge. Um, but in a lot of cases, I think it's a legitimate thing. And Paul really took pride in this. Uh, it kind of proved that he was not mercenary. He wasn't in ministry for all the money that can be made. Ha, ha, ha. I laugh about that because I was in ministry for 31 years and didn't exactly make a fortune in, uh, in ministry. So we received financial support from the churches in Macedonia, especially uh, Phil uh, the Philippians. Therefore, he was able to offer his ministry to the Corinthians uh, free of charge. And in 2 Corinthians, there's a, kind of a discussion about that, that eventually, I hope we get to 2 Corinthians, before Yeshua returns in power and great glory. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll get around to that. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia and rejoined Paul, uh, they were the first, uh, they went first to the Jewish synagogue and preached the gospel of Yeshua the Messiah. When the Jews who opposed the gospel began to persecute the apostles, they started a house church in the home of a guy named Titius Justus, Justus. Crispus, the synagogue ruler, having believed, joined the house church. Now, this is a big deal. Uh, Crispus was the rabbi in the synagogue, and usually it was the lay members who became believers, but Crispus, the synagogue ruler, became a believer, and it caused some conflict uh, in, uh, in the Jewish community. Uh, there in Corinth, as we will read in uh, chapter 18. So having believed, um, uh, Crispus joined the uh, house church. Maybe uh, there was a house church in his house, since he was already a leader. Sosthenes, who also uh, later would become a believer, replaced Crispus as the synagogue. So this synagogue was having trouble keeping their rabbis. They lose their first one because he becomes a believer. So they replaced him with Sosthenes, and he became a believer. So, uh, I don't know, kind of ironic uh, there. So, uh, Paul's uh, Jewish opponents brought him before the uh, Roman proconsul and charged him with religious crimes. Not civil crimes, but religious crimes. This was shortly followed by widespread persecution of the Christians uh, who were perceived correctly by the Romans to be a sect of uh, Judaism. Now, this is an interesting kind of turning point in the history of the early church. Because up until this point, I think this is the first mention in the New Testament of persecution coming from a Roman source. Um, uh, in all other occasions previously, the persecution of the Christians came from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, other uh, Jewish uh, leaders. A lot of people are surprised about that because the Apostles' Creed says that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. But if you read the trial of Yeshua, Pilate tried repeatedly to let him go, 
uh, to declare him innocent and just send him on his way. But it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees who insisted on his uh, death. So this may be a turning point uh, when the uh, persecution becomes more Gentile than, than Jewish. While in Corinth, Paul took a temporary Nazarite vow, and the uh, kind of the instructions from the law of Moses about Nazarite vows are written in number six, uh, one through 21. And a lot of people are uh, surprised that Paul, a New Testament Nazarene Christian, would take a vow uh, of a Nazarene, which is an Old Testament uh, practice. But I think this is not the only occasion where a uh, Christian believer would embrace a, uh, a, a Nazarene, uh, I'm sorry, a Nazarite uh, vow. And it involved growing your hair long and abstaining from the fruit of the uh, grapevine and touching dead bodies and so forth. And uh, there are a lot of uh, Nazarenes uh, in the Bible. We won't bother to talk about that now, but Paul took a, a Nazarite uh, vow. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 1 through 16 is where the story of this Nazarite vow and the end of his second missionary journey is told. So Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla left Corinth and came to Ephesus. Paul was on his way to Jerusalem, but uh, he left them there in, uh, in Ephesus, and, and they did uh, really effective ministry there in Ephesus. So he had met them in Corinth, and then they traveled with him to Ephesus and started doing ministry there. Uh, on his third missionary journey, Paul and his uh, colleagues came first to Ephesus, where he met some disciples of a guy named Apollos, and we will uh, learn more about him in a few minutes uh, here. From Ephesus, Paul began his long-distance uh, ministry to the church at Corinth, which involved several brief visits uh, to Corinth and several letters also, two of which are preserved as 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and we're going to study uh, one of them. Now, uh, I think the best way to, um, to learn about this long-distance ministry that Paul did while he was in Ephesus, notice the square here, 52 to 55 AD, Paul is in Ephesus, and these are, uh, the, uh, the material in these boxes are some of the interactions that he had with the Corinthians and the church at Corinth while he was living in Ephesus. So uh, his first visit to uh, Corinth is in Acts chapter 18, which we'll read about in a few minutes, and that was 50 to 51 AD or CE. Letter A. Now, there are four letters mentioned here, and they're not numbered one, two, three, and four. They're identified by letters, and that's a good way to do it because it becomes very confusing. Uh, you would think that the first letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth would be 1 Corinthians, but it's not. Interesting, huh? Paul's first letter to Corinth is mentioned in 1 Corinthians as having been previously written. So when we get to 1 Corinthians 5, we will notice that and realize that he had written a letter to, Cor to the Corinthians while he was in Ephesus prior to uh, writing uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, visitors from Corinth, um, uh, and I think uh, specifically from Chloe's household and three men, came to visit Paul in Ephesus. Um, uh, so here are some people coming from Corinth, traveling to Ephesus to see Paul and explain to him some of the things that are going on in Corinth. So um, uh, Corinthians uh, letter to, I think they came bearing this letter uh, from the Corinthians to Paul. And when you read 1 Corinthians, it seems like Paul is taking this letter item by item and responding to the things that the Corinthians asked him in letter A. Uh, so letter B is actually 1 Corinthians, and it's Paul's second letter where he answers the the questions or the issues that the uh, Corinthians uh, explained to him or asked him about in uh, their letter uh, to him. So uh, after he writes 1 Corinthians, uh, he sends Timothy to Corinth, uh, and Timothy delivers letter B. What is letter B? It's 1 Corinthians. So Paul writes 1 Corinthians, gives it to Timothy, and Timothy takes it in person to uh, Corinth. 
but he's got more of a mission than that. So uh, he comes to Corinth with first, first Corinthians. And then we have the second visit of Paul to Corinth. The first was when he founded the church. Now he makes another visit and uh, delivers a letter. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. He makes a second visit to Corinth. And this is what Paul calls his second, I'm sorry, his painful visit. And he uses that terminology in 2 Corinthians, which he wrote letter, which he wrote later, a letter he wrote later while he was in Macedonia traveling towards Corinth. So there is a visit that Paul makes, and it was painful. And the reason for that is Paul had to be a disciplinarian. He had to be strict with these people and uh, just be very straight with them and maybe even kind of threaten them uh, as a spiritual leader. So then there's letter C, and that is Paul's third letter. And that is a letter that Paul calls the severe letter, which follows from his visit. So this is a follow-up letter that he sent to uh, Corinth. Uh, then uh, Paul leaves Ephesus, and we enter into the green part here. So Paul leaves Ephesus and travels to Macedonia uh, and uh, receives a report from Titus. Um, uh, from Titus, there's apostrophe here, uh, Titus's visit to uh, Corinth. And Paul writes about that in 2 Corinthians 7. Then we've got letter D, which is Paul's fourth letter, which is actually 2 Corinthians, which he writes from Macedonia. Then Titus visits Corinth again and delivers letter D. What's letter D? 2 Corinthians. And then we have letter E, and there's a bunch of question marks here. There may be some references in 2 Corinthians 10 to 13, but that's so far down the road to us. I'm not going to say whether or not there was an additional letter. So there may be as many as, uh, this would be letter E if it's, if it's a legitimate letter. So there may have been as many as five. And then we've got the third visit to Corinth, uh, which was kind of the end of Paul's travels through Macedonia. And that's in 56 AD. And he wrote the book of Romans there. Now, I want to go through this chart and talk about some of these Bible passages and kind of show you what I'm talking about. So um, we talk about uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 3, which is, uh, uh, oh, I, I'm taking these out of order. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 is mentioned uh, first here in letter A, which is Paul's first letter to Corinth. And here is where it says in 1 Corinthians, which was, what did we say? Letter B. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, I wrote to you in my letter, in letter A, not to mix together with sexually immoral people. So Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians that he had written a letter previously. So you can see it right in the text. Then we have uh, 2 Corinthians 2.1, which is mentioned here in connection with Paul's second visit to Corinth. And this is, he writes this in 2 Corinthians 2 after his painful visit. So he says, I made up my mind that I would not come to you again, causing sorrow. That's why he calls it a painful uh, visit. Then we have 2 Corinthians 2.3, which is uh, something that is referred to, where Paul refers to as, uh, to his uh, severe uh, letter in some versions, and maybe something else uh, here. So uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 3, I wrote this very thing in the severe letter to you so that when I came for his third visit, I wouldn't have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is yours. For out of much distress and anguish of heart, I wrote to you in the severe letter with many tears, not to make you sorrowful, but to let you know the love I have especially for you. So this shows us how uh, seriously uh, Paul took his relationship with the Corinthians. Well, with, uh, you know, with all of his uh, fellow believers in Yeshua, but especially the Corinthians. He shed tears over it. He lost sleep uh, over it. He was in distress and anguish and uh, so forth. So then we have 2 Corinthians 7.13, which is... Uh, uh, Paul's reaction to uh, his uh, report from Titus, and uh, he writes about it in 2 Corinthians 7. For this reason, we have been encouraged. Besides our own encouragement, rejoiced even more at the joy of Titus, 
who gave him this good report because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For I have boasted uh, some to him about you, and I was not put to shame. So Paul was doing all these boasting to Titus about the Corinthians, and then he sends him to Corinth. And then he's just, he says, boy, I hope he doesn't find that place to be a disaster because that's going to make me look like an idiot. Uh, so uh, yeah, he had boasted about the Corinthians and he was not put to shame. So they, they came, the Corinthians came through for him. But as we spoke all things truthfully to you, so also our boasting in Titus has proved to be the truth. Now, it will not be important that you like memorize all these communications and visits and all these different letters that he wrote when we study uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. But just to have you aware of this background and the interaction that kind of lies behind uh, 1 Corinthians, I think, will be uh, helpful. And that's the end of our slideshow. So let's go ahead and jump into the text of Acts chapter uh, 18. We'll begin at the first verse, and we are reading here, as you can see, from the Tree of Life version. Again, it's a Messianic Jewish version. Maybe you'll uh, see some kind of unique features of Messianic Jewish versions of the uh, Bible. We have a Greek text also. It's a it's the, probably the best uh, Greek uh, New Testament text we have, the Nestle Allen 28th edition with all kinds of study aids. So we can highlight these Greek words and get definitions down in the information window at the bottom of the page, uh, stuff like that. And we also have a modern Hebrew New Testament also with Strong's information for Hebrew words, but it's not information for the Hebrew words, it's information for the Greek words li that lie behind the Hebrew words. So it's basically going to be a, a repetition of the information we have from the Greek New Testament. Now, let me just mention something very briefly. I believe there is plenty of evidence uh, in uh, documents from uh, the first century and uh, shortly thereafter that would lead us to believe that the New Testament was written first in Hebrew and later was translated to Greek, maybe a short time later, maybe a long time later. And there are uh, significant uh, reasons um, why that might be, uh, but also there are significant reasons why we don't have any uh, New Testament manuscripts written in Hebrew. And I think it's because the Greek Christians later on were persecuting the Hebrew Christians, and I bet they burned their books. Now, I still have high hopes that the Dead Sea, the further exploration for, for more Dead Sea Scrolls material may turn up some um, uh, Hebrew New Testament documents. So far, they haven't found any. But I just wanted to explain that because I don't want you to get the idea that the Hebrew text that we are looking at in our Bible studies are those original Hebrew um, New Testament documents. This is a modern Hebrew New Testament uh, and so it's just a, I mean, it was uh, translated within the last probably 50 years or so. So uh, it's modern, it's not ancient, but it's uh, sometimes it's helpful, especially if we're using a uh, Messianic uh, Jewish uh, version of the New Testament for our studies. Okay, let's launch into Acts 18, which is the story of the founding of the church at Corinth. After these things, which would be Paul's preaching on the Areopagus, Mars Hill in Athens, uh, he left there and went to Corinth. There he found a Jewish uh, man named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, who was the Roman emperor, had commanded all Jewish people to leave Rome, and Paul went to, uh, to see them uh, in uh, Corinth. Um, this um, a banishment of the Jews uh, by Emperor Claudius from Rome um, I, th I think it was in 52 CE, was, according to the historian Suetonius, it was because of debates and arguments and probably hostility and violence between the Jewish sects, uh, between the, um, uh, the Nazarene Essenes on the one hand and the Pharisees and the Sadducees on the other hand. 
And Suetonius says that the arguments were about Crestus, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S, which sounds an awful lot like Christ, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think that's what the uh, debates were about, the arguments were about. We know that the Pharisees and Sadducees persecuted and even um, martyred the uh, early Nazarene uh, Essenes. So uh, that may be the reason why the uh, all the Jews, uh, the emperor just wanted to be done with all of them. So he kicked them all out, the believers and unbelievers, the Nazarene Essenes, Pharisees and Sadducees, they all had to leave Rome. I think eventually they went back after Claudius died and Nero became the emperor, um, uh, the Jewish community, believers and unbelievers, came back to Rome. So, uh, yeah, Paul went to see uh, them, Aquila and Priscilla. And because he was of the same trade, tent making, he stayed with them and began working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was debating, Paul was debating every Shabbat, uh, in English that would be Sabbath day, that's the seventh day of the week, it's Saturday, it's not Sunday, uh, but it was the day uh, Jewish people observed as the Sabbath day. Now, New Testament believers, uh, Nazarenes, Christians, uh, could celebrate the Sabbath day or not. It was optional because they had entered into a lifelong rest, not just a one day of rest. If you want to read up on that, read uh, uh, the book of Hebrews. And also, I think there's uh, some information on the Sabbath rest in the book of uh, Galatians. Galatians and Hebrews are uh, good sources to study when it comes to uh, do New Testament believers have any relationship with the uh, Old Testament and the law of Moses. So uh, Paul's typical routine was every city he came to, the first stop was the synagogue. Again, because everybody knew the Bible there, everybody knew uh, Jewish tradition and so forth. It was a great place for Paul to start uh, preaching Yeshua. And he was trying to persuade both Jewish and Greek people. Uh, some people are surprised to hear that there were Greeks in the synagogues, but a lot of, uh, or Gentiles of any kind, not just Greeks. Uh, but there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of Jewish evangelism going on in these days. And synagogues would have a significant number of Gentiles who were probably studying Judaism with an eye to converting, either a total conversion. Uh, or a, a more distant uh, conversion. Um, the uh, Jews talked about um, the uh, more distant conversion as being uh, proselytes or converts of the gate. Um, but those who went the full route, which included circumcision and baptism, and uh, you know, just a, a, a vow to embrace, the, it would be the old covenant and the law of Moses. Uh, those were called proselytes or converts of righteousness. And the Jews considered them completely Jewish. So the fact that they're called Greeks or Gentiles here is an indication that they haven't come to the point of uh, converting to, uh, to Judaism. And uh, um, uh, they're also called God-fearers. God-fearers is usually a reference to Gentiles who believe in the God of the Bible, the God of Israel. Uh, uh, verse 5. Now, when uh, Silas and Timothy arrived from uh, Macedonia, Macedonia, Paul became occupied with the message, uh, urgently testifying to the Jewish people that Yeshua is the Messiah. Uh, Jewish people were very familiar with the concept of the Messiah. Uh, he was promised all the way from Genesis 3.15 and throughout the, uh, the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, even in the Psalms. So they knew what the Messiah was, but Paul was emphasizing that Yeshua fit the bill. He was the guy. He was the promised Messiah uh, who was uh, to come. And notice uh, some of these names uh, haven't been changed to uh, Hebrew uh, versions, like Silas is not Sila with an H on the end. Um, and uh, Paul is mentioned here as Paul. It's not Paulos or it's not Shaul. See, some of the um, Messianic Jewish versions call him Shaul, even when the Greek text calls him Paulos. So the tree, uh, at this point, the tree of life, uh, I think it's more accurate 
and faithful to the Greek text than the complete Jewish Bible and whichever ones also uh, call him Shaul uh, throughout. I don't think they ever referred to him as Paul. Uh, verse 6, but when they resisted and reviled him there in the synagogue, he shook out his garments and said, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Now, I think this, uh, this act of shaking out his garments, it's like shaking off the dust of your city. I shake it on you. I leave even the dust of your city here. And they would shake off their sandals and stuff like that. So they wouldn't track this unbelieving dust around behind them. Uh, but um, when Paul says, I'm clean, I think it's a reference to, I believe it's in the prophet Ezekiel, where God says, uh, if you notice that a person is sinning or they're falling short of the glory of God, the word, uh, falling short of the word of God, <clears throat> and you don't warn them about it, then he says, I will hold you accountable for that. If you could straighten them out and you don't, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you accountable for that. Now, it doesn't mean you can't be saved if you don't witness to every person that you have an opportunity. You can be forgiven of the sin, but God holds you accountable for it. So you need to uh, confess it and repent of it, known sins and unknown sins, and, and get forgiven. But Paul is saying, look, I fulfilled my obligation uh, from um, uh, Ezekiel. Oh, and by the way, if you do warn them and they don't heed the warning, then they will suffer for their sins, but you, you're you clean, you're innocent, you did what you were obligated to do. If they repent and believe, then what a blessing for you. I mean, yeah, you're in good shape, but they're in good shape too, and you've won your, you've won your brother. Okay, uh, verse 7. After leaving there, uh, Paul went into the house of a man named Titius uh, Eustus, a God-fearer. So uh, Titius Eustus, that is obviously a Greek or even a Latin uh, name, uh, perhaps. So he was obviously a Gentile, a God-fearer. But they met him, in, in, I assume, in the synagogue. He was one of those uh, God-fearers. He was one of those uh, Gentiles who was there probably contemplating uh, conversion to Judaism. But the idea here seems to be that uh, although Titius Eustace was considering con converting to probably Phariseeism, he apparently changed his mind and said, I think I'm going to convert to Nazareneism, to I'm going to become a Christian. Uh, Crispus, the synagogue leader, put his faith in the Lord along with his whole household. And uh, many of the Corinthians, upon hearing, were uh, believing and being immersed. Uh, the word in uh, Greek here is baptized. But again, uh, in this Messianic Jewish version, it says immersed. And uh, let me to explain the reason uh, for that uh, to you. Uh, throughout the history of the Jewish people, um, since the time of Yeshua, uh, there have been many times throughout that history where the Christian church has persecuted Jewish people and even forced them to convert to a Judaism. So the Jews talk about forced baptisms. And uh, sometimes it was, uh, I mean, they just put water on them when they didn't want water on them. And sometimes it was a threat, like if you don't get baptized, we're going to kill you because you have a, what the Christians of those eras believed was a, uh, a false religion, the religion of the Pharisees, the religion of uh, Judaism. So they, uh, so Jewish people are very much aware that through, throughout their history, uh, Christians have forced baptism on them. And that's why the word baptized isn't used here. Now you can say, well, immersed means the same thing. Yes, it does. And that's why the word is used but the word immersed doesn't have the same religious baggage, especially for Jews, that the word baptism does. Is immersed the same as baptism? Yep. And it's even the word that's used in the Greek uh, New Testament. So Crispus, who was the synagogue leader, maybe is now a synagogue in um, a church that maybe is meeting in his household. His household is mentioned here. The other members of his house also became uh, believers in Yeshua. So uh, cool. And 
you know, the, the number of believers may have been numerous enough that there were numerous house churches. Uh, verse 9, now the Lord said to Paul in a vision in the night, do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. Now, I'm going to mention just briefly what I think is the difference between a dream and a vision. Uh, a dream is um, a like a, an internal mental visual picture or imagery or even like a kind of a moving picture that you have while you're asleep. Uh, but um, uh, this is a, a vision in the night. So you might say, well, if it's nighttime, Paul was probably asleep. So a dream and a vision are the same thing. I'm thinking that because the word vision is uh, used here, and let's see if I can see what the, uh, I don't even have the right verse uh, up here. Uh, oramatos, uh, hazon in uh, Greek. Because that word is used, uh, I think it, it's an indication that Paul was awake when the vision, when he had the vision. And a lot of times, I mean, Yeshua stayed up all night praying and a lot of his followers did the same thing. So I think that's the dynamic that's going on here. So what was the uh, content of the uh, vision? I think it was of the Lord himself who was speaking to Paul and said, do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. So Paul's in Corinth. He just got kicked out of the uh, synagogue, but God shows up in his meditations of the night and says, don't be afraid. Um, uh, so go ahead and speak out about uh, Yeshua and don't be silent just because you've experienced kind of a negative reaction to the gospel. Don't stop preaching the gospel. So it's an encouragement to go on and speak. And I think there's a kind of an implied uh, protection here. Uh, the vision uh, goes on. The Lord goes on for I am with you and no one shall attack you to harm you. Many people in this city are for me. That was good for Paul to know. Now, um, I think what this means, I think the Lord is saying, people may attack you, but they won't harm you. In other words, I'm going to protect you from, uh, I mean, from suffering any physical or mental and emotional harm uh, and uh, potentially even martyrdom. Because uh, the Lord had people, probably a lot of them unbelievers at this point, but he wanted them to be reached with the gospel. So he wanted to uh, encourage Paul to continue with the ministry there. So he stayed there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But while Gallio was pro council of Achaia, the Jewish leaders made a united attack against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. Now, when it talks about Jewish leaders, uh, like this. And what does the, uh, let me see what the Greek uh, says here. Um, hoi eudaioi, that is the Jews. Now, the uh, Tree of Life version has inserted the word leaders here because they want it to be well understood that it was not every Jewish person in Corinth who persecuted the apostles. It was only those who followed the Jewish leaders, the unbelieving Jewish leaders, undoubtedly from the Pharisees, maybe the Sadducees, uh, in the persecution that these leaders uh, visited on the apostles. So it's only the Jewish leadership. So although the word leaders is inserted in the text here, I think it's a good insertion, and I'm glad it's there because it makes that point clearer than perhaps even the Greek text uh, does. So Gallio's there, Jewish uh, leaders made a, unbelieving uh, Jewish leaders made a united attack against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. The judgment seat is the Bema, the, uh, like B-E-M-A uh, seat, the case in uh, Hebrew, uh, this is the judgment seat. And the, the idea of a judgment seat pops up all over the place in the uh, New Testament. In um, 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 5, uh, we hear about the judgment seat of Christ. So Christ will sit on a bema seat or a bema seat, saying, um, here's what the Jewish religious leader said, this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the Torah. Now, when we get into 1 Corinthians, we'll talk about this. This is not a made-up lie. Because uh, what these uh, Pharisaic Jewish religious leaders are saying is that these Nazarenes, these Nazarene Christians, 
do not practice the law of Moses and the old covenant laws the way we do, because they say they're New Testament or new covenant people operating by a new law. And it is a biblical law. The New Testament law is a, is a biblical law. It's, I mean, that's what the New Testament is about, is, is the law that governs believers in Yeshua. Uh, but um, look, uh, Essenes and Nazarenes did not offer animal sacrifices like the law of Moses required. And there were practical reasons for that. But there were, uh, I mean, one of the reasons was they don't have to do it anymore once they gain an understanding of what the animal sacrifices were all about, they were pointing to Yeshua. So as believers in Yeshua, they didn't have to offer animal sacrifices anymore because their sins were forgiven once and for all. So there is truth in this accusation. They persuade men to worship contrary to the Torah. Yes, because there's a new Torah. There's a new instruction. And by the way, the word Torah, and it, uh, what is it in the uh, Greek? Let me uh, check it out in the Greek. The word Torah is, um, oh, it's actually, oh, here it is, nomon. Nomon is a Greek word that means law, but that's really not the heart and soul of Torah. Torah is instruction. It's like the instruction that a mentor or a master gives to a disciple. So uh, anyway, um, so yeah, these new covenant believers are practicing the Torah differently, and maybe not at all uh, from the way uh, these Jews uh, thought it should be done. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jewish people, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or a vicious crime, there would be reason to put up with you, O Jews. Uh, so in other words, if if Paul has broken a civil law. If he's stolen from someone or if he's defrauded someone or committed sexual immorality or something, although they'd have to kill everybody in Corinth for that. He said, then I'd listen to your case, but I don't care about your religious differences. So uh, verse 15, since it is issues about words, names, and your own law, that would be religious law, See to it yourselves. I do not wish to be a judge of these things. So he drove them from the judgment seat. I'm sure Gallio had lots of like Roman soldiers accompanying him, and they probably got out their spears and started prodding these Jews out of the, uh, uh, the judgment hall. Uh, so like, how did the Jews react to that? Well, they all grabbed Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio paid no attention to these things. Now, a good question to ask is, who's the they? Who started beating Sosthenes? Some people think it was these Roman soldiers that were driving the, these Jews from the uh, judgment hall. And since Sosthenes, at this point, an unbeliever, is the leader of the group, then these Romans just uh, beat the stuffing out of him. But others think it wasn't Sosthenes at all, or it wasn't the Jews at all. The they, I'm sorry, uh, some believe that the they was not the Romans at all, but that it was the Jews. It was the, uh, you know, the uh, J Jewish people are beating Sosthenes. Well, why would the Jews beat their own guy? Well, Sosthenes is the synagogue ruler, and they the and so the members, the disciples who were following him, were counting on him to present a persuasive enough case to Gallio that he would um, that he would uh, kill uh, you know punish Paul or you know fine him, imprison him, maybe even uh, execute him, uh, but he didn't. So. His Jewish followers may have been so disappointed in him that they beat him up. So who is the they? I do not know. It may be the Romans. It may have been the Jews. Uh, but Gallio didn't pay any attention to the beating. He, he could care less. Uh, verse 18, Paul, having stayed many more days, said farewell to the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. Remember them, uh, his fellow tent makers, his friends from Corinth, 
Well, they're traveling with him. At Concrea, Paul had uh, his hair cut off. Now, remember, the Nazarene vow that he took involved growing his hair long. So we don't know how long he had been under the Nazarene vow. Some Nazarene vows were lifelong. Some of them were, most of them were just temporary. Uh, it could have been a very short time. But when the Nazarene vow came to an end, then the however much hair had grown, that was cut off. Uh, just to signify that the vow was over and, uh, you know, you could go back to uh, drinking your wine or grape juice or whatever. Uh, for he was keeping that vow. Uh, and, and this would be a, although it's not called a Nazarene vow, uh, that's what it is. It's not a Nazarene vow, a Nazarite vow. I always give people a hard time for mixing those two up and now I'm mixing them up. Uh, verse 19, when they arrived at Ephesus, Paul left Pr Priscilla and Aquila there, but he himself went into the synagogue and debated with the Jewish people. So he's starting a new ministry in Ephesus, and like in all the other places, he goes first to the synagogue, and what does he do? He preaches Yeshua there. When they ask him to stay longer, he declined. So here he's not getting kicked out. Uh, or maybe he did get kicked out, and the people who want him to stay longer are just those who have come to faith in, in Yeshua. Uh, but he declined. So why would he decline? Here's an opportunity for doing gospel ministry. Well, he's headed to Jerusalem for a good reason. Uh, when they asked him to stay, he declined. Instead, taking leave of them uh, while saying, God willing, I'll return to you again and continue the ministry here. And he set sail from Ephesus. After landing at Caesarea, uh, he went up to greet the Messiah's community, and then he went down to uh, Antioch. Now, some people get bent out of shape when it says he went down to Antioch, and they go, wait a minute, Antioch is north of uh, Jerusalem, so you'd go up. And actually, um, uh, Jerusalem is not even mentioned uh, here, uh, but Caesarea is south of Antioch, uh, too. But when you leave Jerusalem, any direction you go is down because it's the holy city. So the direction, uh, uh, you know, going up, uh, he went up, greeted the Messiah's community. Then he went down to Antioch. Going up, I think, is an implication that he went up to, uh, to Jerusalem. <clears throat> And then he went down to Antioch, even though that was to the north, because Antioch wasn't as holy as Jerusalem was. After spending some time there, he departed and went one place after another throughout the region of Galatia. This is the beginning of his third missionary journey. And Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Uh, now, a Jewish man named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. So Paul left Ephesus, but now the book of Acts is taking us back to Ephesus, where he had left, where Paul had left Aquila and Priscilla. Now, a Jewish man named Apollos, a native of, of Alexandria, which is in Egypt, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man, very scholarly, well-versed in the scriptures. So his knowledge was biblical. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. <clears throat> now, that could mean that just uh, he'd been instructed in the ways of God the Father and maybe the Holy Spirit and maybe the coming Messiah, but he might not have known anything about Yeshua, the second person of the Trinity. I don't think that's what it means. I think he had a knowledge of Yeshua. Maybe he had been... Uh, a disciple of John the Baptist. And in a few verses, I'll, I'll show you why I think that uh, that may be. Uh, he has a fervent spirit. He was speaking uh, and accurately teaching the facts about Yeshua. So see, he, he knows Yeshua while only being acquainted with the immersion of John. So he may have been a disciple of John the Baptist, and then he left the promised land, the Jordan River region, and traveled back to uh, Alexandria. And now he's come to Ephesus for whatever reason, probably ministry, uh, very well versed in the teachings of uh, John the Baptist. This man began speaking boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately. So what did they tell him? I think they told him about Yeshua. 
uh, that John the Baptist had baptized him and kind of given him the good housekeeping seal of approval. They probably told him about the Sermon on the Mount, all of Jesus' teachings, all of his miracles, certainly about his death on the cross and uh, resurrection and the implications of all that. And they, uh, they brought him up to speed on what God had been uh, doing uh, through Yeshua. Now, it mentions here that both Priscilla and Aquila uh, did this explaining. So it sounds like a woman named Priscilla is teaching a man named Apollos. And, uh, you know, when you get into this debate about what women are allowed to do and not to do in a church, what they're allowed to teach and not to teach in a church, it's just a very gray area. So I just bring it to your attention. And it looks like uh, here is an example of a woman who believes in Yeshua teaching a man who's not her husband who believes in Yeshua. Uh, that's as far as I want to go with that. When Apollos wanted to cross over to Achaia, in other words, he's headed for Corinth, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. Upon arrival, he greatly helped those who by grace had believed now that he's been further instructed. Now, it's possible that he went to Athens, but remember, there's not a church there. So the, the only brethren that I'm aware of that um, uh, are mentioned prominently from Achaia is the uh, Corinthians. Uh, for he powerfully refuted the Jewish people in public, demonstrating uh, through the scriptures that the Messiah was Yeshua. Now, I'm almost out of time, but I want to take just a few minutes to talk about Paul, the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. While Apollos was at Corinth, uh, there, see, it says he was at Corinth. Paul traveled through the upper region and came to uh, Ephesus, that is through Asia Minor. He found some disciples in Ephesus undoubtedly disciples of Apollos. And he said to them, did you receive the Ruach HaKodesh when you believed? Ruach HaKodesh is the Hebrew way of saying the Holy Spirit. Kodesh is the Hebrew word for holy, and Ruach is the, um, the Hebrew word for spirit. So this is uh, HaKodesh is the Holy Spirit. So Ruach HaKodesh, we'll come across it all the time. It's a, it's a neat Hebrew expression to become aware of. So uh, next time you want to talk about the Holy Spirit, just call him the Ruach HaKodesh, and everybody will be impressed. So uh, Paul asked them, did you receive the Ruach HaKodesh when you believed? They replied to him, no, we've uh, never even heard that there is a Ruach HaKodesh. So it's kind of surprising that Apollos, who has been brought up to date on the full gospel, didn't talk to these guys about the Ruach HaKodesh, but maybe his further instruction hadn't happened yet, and that when he became fully informed about the gospel, he may have left immediately for Corinth and left these guys behind without the, uh, you know, the proper instruction, the full instruction. So they replied, and we haven't even heard that there is a Ruach HaKodesh. He said, into what were you immersed or baptized? They said, into Yohanan or John's immersion, John the Baptist. So uh, this connection with John the Baptist and Apollos uh, comes up here. Uh, they were uh, instructed well about John's baptism, which sounds like it came from Apollos before he was uh, brought up to date. Paul said, John immersed with an immersion of repentance, telling people that they should uh, believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Yeshua. And when they heard this, they were immersed in the name of the Lord uh, Yeshua. Now, it may seem obvious who was immersed here in the name of the Lord Yeshua, but it's not. So um, this part of the sentence telling the people that they should believe in the one coming after him, that is in Yeshua, may be words that John uh, spoke. Paul is quoting uh, John. In that case, anybody who received John's baptism uh, understood that it was a baptism into Yeshua. Okay? So, in that case, the people who were being baptized by John at the Jordan River were also baptized into Yeshua. That's a legitimate understanding of the Greek text of this passage. But it could, but the they here who were immersed in the name of the Lord Yeshua 
might be these Ephesian uh, Ephesian uh, disciples. So uh, yeah, John, you know, uh, John immersed with a uh, immersion of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one coming after him. Uh, when they, the Ephesian believers, heard this, they were immersed in the name of the Lord Yeshua. Now, there are implications of both viewpoints. The implication of the people who were baptized in the name of the Lord Yeshua being disciples of John means that everybody who's received John's baptism has also been baptized into Yeshua. But if it's a reference to the Ephesian disciples who were baptized in the name of the Lord Yeshua, then that means if you don't have the full gospel, you need to be rebaptized. They were baptized into John's baptism, but if it, but if that wasn't sufficient, then they needed to be baptized fully in in the name of Yeshua, by the authority of Yeshua, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, whichever one it is, it doesn't really matter because nobody's being baptized by John anymore. So uh, a modern day application for us, it, do it doesn't matter. But there are some churches, like if you leave, uh, say, for example, if you leave a church that baptizes infants and you go join a church that doesn't, they will rebaptize you. Almost certainly they will rebaptize you as an adult believer who can confess uh, Messiah. So anyway, when they heard this, they were immersed in the name of the Lord Yeshua. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Ruach HaKodesh, who's that? Holy Spirit, came upon them and they began speaking in tongues or languages and prophesying, just like it happened to the uh, disciples on the day of Pentecost, to the disciples in Samaria, to the disciples in, um, I was going to say Ephesus, but this is Ephesus. So uh, the speaking in tongues and prophesying, manifesting spiritual gifts, is oftentimes thought to be uh, an indication that a person's faith in Yeshua is authentic. They have legitimately received the Holy Spirit, and he is pouring out of them like rivers of living water. Uh, manifesting these spiritual gifts. And in all, there were about 12 men. Good number for disciples, right? So that's as far as we're going to read today. Uh, let me give you the uh, New Testament blessing, and then we'll call it quits, and I hope you'll tune in for uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 coming down the road. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit uh, be with you all. In Jesus' name, amen.